God is so faithful to us in all of the ways in which we have come today from various locations. This cathedral is here and all of our guests and visitors. I am a part of an incredible family, uh, the Harris family. I've been a part of that family for 52 years. And uh, my brother is the academician in our family. He is the president of the Ecumenical Theological Seminary. And uh, he has always been the smartest of all of us. But I asked him if he comes today to share a little bit of the Azusa experience with us. And Dr. Hyman, you moved him in such a way last night. And so I just want us to lean in for just a moment, if you all would allow that. How many of you want to learn? You don't just want to burn. You want to learn. Touch yourself and say, you're here to learn and then burn. Is that all right? Please receive my brother, Dr. Kenneth Earl Harris. Come on, Dr. Harris. Hallelujah. Come on here. He's the smartest of all of us. Now, I'm pretty smart, but <laughs> come on, sir. Praise the Lord, saints. It is uh, good to be back. I, uh, my uh, daughters told me uh, that there was something going on this weekend over here. And I said, well, y'all enjoy yourselves. <laughs> but Bishop and I have been talking recently, and she ministered at a workshop at, for the seminary recently, and she was talking about uh, the use of technology in ministry, and she turned it down. I don't know how you <laughs> hoop on technology, <laughs> but she did, and it, was, and it was tremendous. And so she'll be working with me at the seminary, and we'll be talking and praying about some things. But I was so moved by this young lady right here last night. I was going to run through here last night and just say, hey, y'all. But it was so rich and so uh, engaging. And then my sister did a word. And I said, wow. Not, not only does she know something, <laughs> but she knows how to tell it. And the spirit worked with her last night. And uh, she quickened something in my spirit. And, and I'm just going to share a little bit of it uh, at, at this time. She She talked about bishop and her role as an apostle, not a American apostle, <laughs> but an African <laughs> apostle with African rootage. And I said, hallelujah to that. And it took me back to some years ago when I first went to Africa, uh, I went to Kenya and then to Ethiopia. And when I got to Kenya, I, I got off the plane and it was just like flying to, uh, I hope there are no Kenyans there who, who would take offense, but it was like getting off the plane in L.A. Uh, Nairobi was not much different uh, than our uh, western uh, cities. 
And then we got on an Ethiopian uh, jet and flew to Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. And something really interesting happened that I could not, that was totally unexpected. I went down the step at the airport and stepped on the ground in Ethiopia. And I said, what is this that just hit me? I mean, it was like, you know, a shock. I, 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 I've been to Israel numerous times. I never felt what I felt when I stepped on Ethiopian soil. And there was something that said to me, this is holy ground. This is holy ground. This is holy ground. And so... As we traveled through Ethiopia, and all of the uh, cities were, uh, had biblical names, but I was just puzzled by this thing, this move. Of, uh, I understand now the Spirit was saying to me, you're home. This is your spiritual grounding right here. And I explored that with uh, the Ethiopian Christians that we traveled with. And they reaffirmed the fact that the connection of Ethiopia, southern Africa, and uh, the uh, development of religion both in the old with the Queen of Sheba, This is 1000 BC when she showed up in Jerusalem with her chocolate brown self. <laughs> and Solomon had, what, 700 wives? 300 concubines? But he had never seen. He'd never seen anything like the queen, the Sheba. And the historians in Ethiopia shared with me that she didn't just show up. But Solomon, like a magnet, was attracted to this queen who came really, she had heard so much about Solomon and his wealth that she got all the good stuff she could uh, uh, pull together and said, I'm going to go and I'm going to impress him. Yeah, oh, she brought some stuff with her. But when she got there, she said, the half hasn't been told because what God had done in Israel was uh, fantastic and amazing, and even the queen was impressed but as she um, and Solomon uh, got together in a lot of different ways, and the story goes that they had a son. And when she went back to Ethiopia, she took with her the Judaic faith. 1000 BC, that to this day, uh, when they started, remember back in, back in the day, some of you weren't born then, but when, back in the day when uh, they were um, uh, flying in Ethiopian Jews to Israel for the first time. Yeah. Uh, and um, they, uh, there, was, there was a lot of question about are they Jews? But when they started doing the, um, uh, the genetic markers, 
the scientific study of their blood, they found out that the Ethiopian Jews were in some respects had a stronger genetic Jewish DNA than the Jews in Israel. Now, that's a fact. That's scientific fact. They had the markers. And if you go there now, you still have this, the, maybe the most ancient, more, most authentic expression of Jewish worship that's in Ethiopia. Because what they took back, they have maintained because of their isolation from the West and even from Israel itself. Israel is a secular nation now, just like us. But the Ethiopian faith in Judaism is as strong as it, as, as it has ever been. Now, here's a story. Uh, about 15, 10 or 15 years ago, before I went to Ethiopia, I hooked up with, with an Ethiopian congregation who uh, we agreed to let them worship in our building on Oakland Boulevard. And so they, they were there for about two years. And um, they brought in a priest from Ethiopia to shepherd this congregation. Uh, and their brand of Christianity was very interesting because uh, this particular congregation mixed old and new. So the, the Americanized version was a little different in that uh, they still uh, uh, observed um, the Holy of Holies and the veil, the incense, and some of the other elements of, of the Jewish faith, but in a Christian context. Yeah. And so um, uh, when I got back from Ethiopia, though, they had left our church, and I was so anxious to tell them <laughs> what I learned in Ethiopia. But when I got to Ethiopia, I found out that the Ethiopian Orthodox Church was one of the great opponents of evangelical faith in Ethiopia, so much so that the Ethiopian Orthodox Church and the Ethiopian government uh, saw uh, evangelical Christianity as a threat. And many evangelicals were being persecuted heavily in Ethiopia. At the same time, the faith was spreading like wildfire because of the Ethiopians who were preaching the gospel in their own nation under great opposition. Now, when I came back to the States, I came back with this thought. I don't know what we're doing in America. I don't even know if it deserves to be called Christianity. I saw demons being cast out. I didn't see it, but I had reports of the dead being raised regularly. Um... I saw, I was teaching the book of Acts at Ashland Theological Seminary at the time. And we were halfway through the course. Then I took off to Ethiopia, right? <laughs> and when I got back home, I said to my class, I apologize. I, I, I apologize because I have taught the book of Acts, the best I knew how until I got to Ethiopia where I saw it in action. I saw Acts chapter 2. I saw the power of God moving every day in the life of these African uh, uh, evangelicals. I'm telling you, it was something to see. And so I'm still moved by the fact that even in America, what we call Pente uh, Pentecostals 
I don't know what that means. When you see what we've done, uh, what we haven't done with regard to our rootage, uh, as fresh, especially the African, African connection. Now, very quickly, Azuzu. Uh, I'd like to like collaborate with some folk, maybe a uh, doctor here, and some others to come back and do something about Azuzu from, from the perspective of history. Because as I look at it, I see Azuzu as the Holy Spirit reconnecting African-American spirituality to its African roots. Okay, yeah, yeah. I haven't thought it through. But when you look at Azuzu, it was a, almost an affront to American Christianity. But it was so powerful that it attracted uh, Euro European Americans and others to Azuzu Street. But it was an African connection there. And, and I'm not talking about African traditional religion. I'm talking about the history of Christianity in Africa. You know, the Ethiopian op eunuch was, was first century taking the gospel back to Africa, where to Ethiopia. And uh, when you look at the list of nations that were in in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, they came from all over the place, including many nations of Africa. And so Christianity is not a white man's religion. When it comes to the African connection, uh, there, 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 there's records that the gospel was being preached in Africa in the third and fourth century. Slavery began its nonsense around the 1500s. Okay. And about the 1600s, it, it was kind of gaining steam. Uh, but uh, Africans took Christianity to Africa. And they impacted the world around them. Azuzu Street brought it Front Street in America. And so, uh, I forget about the year this happened, but the Assemblies of God issued an apology for how they acted when they abandoned Azuzu Street because they came to get what the Holy Spirit was doing among the black leadership at Azuzu Street. They came to learn because they seen nothing like it. And, but when they got what they felt like they needed to, to start their own thing, they left and started the Assemblies of God. Now, God is a forgiving God, and, and I, I'm not hating on nobody because they needed the Holy Ghost just like, just like us. But like he did at Azuzu Street, there's another move of God coming, and it's going to come through people of African descent. It's going to be another wave. And I believe this, that what happening this weekend, God, thank you for, for pushing me in this direction this weekend because I wasn't coming. <laughs> but what I've seen this week are the seeds of what God is going to do in these last days as the gospel, the authentic gospel goes into the world like it's never gone before uh, to represent the power and the glory of our God. Holy Spirit, it's just so much about this thing that we could say. 
But I've got to say this, and, and then uh, because I, I, I don't want to be, a, be a, a, up for too long. But as I think about uh, the role of African American uh, believers uh, and uh, how when the uh, Euro European Americans left Azusa, le abandoned Azusa Street and later apologized, that's one thing. But then w what happened with the Church of God in Christ, of course, started. But in many respects, African Americans abandoned what God gave them at Azusa Street. Yeah. And somehow we've got to retrieve some of that in these last days because God is calling upon us to be the people of God in these last days. As you said last night, Israel was 400 years in slavery. There's a whole lot I can say about Israel in Egypt. <laughs> but let me just say this and move on. That Africans were not slaves in antiquity. They were the slave owners. Egypt was the greatest nation I need to hear what you said. Yes. Yes. Thank you. And so when you look at, you say, why did God have Israel in Egypt, in Africa for 400 years? Because he had a mission for Israel. But they were completely bankrupt in terms of skills, knowledge, anything. So where did he put them? In the Harvard of antiquity, Egypt, where they learned the arts, the sciences, the skills that would be necessary for them to survive and do the work God has called them to do. They couldn't do it just leaving Egypt and going into the, in, into the promised land. They needed what Africa could only give. So when they went out into the wilderness with their arrogant selves, they were able, God said, I, I need you to build a tent. I need you to build this. I need you to build that. And it, it, it involved uh, uh, smithing of gold and silver and wood and, and fabrics and colors and all of that. Where did they learn that? In Africa, in Egypt. And so when God gave Moses a blueprint, this is, uh, this is how I want you to build the tabernacle, you know, and, and, and stuff that, that was uh, um, uh, coated in gold. Where did they learn that from? Africa in Egypt. And so God blessed Africa in ways, and, and there was civilization in Africa Thousands of years before there was civilization in Europe. Civilization did not move from Rome in the west eastward. It started in the east and moved westward. And we're in Timbuktu, had libraries. <laughs> Africa was still coming out of caves. I mean, Europe was still coming, coming out of caves. And I'm not putting down European, but I'm just saying that, you know, what Ron DeSantis is doing in Florida, I want you to hear this, burning the books, banning the books, they know what they're doing. They're trying to reframe history. To tell a lie about the history of civilization, I will say this: that in my in my spirit, in my body, you know, I, you know, I don't just feel 
um, uh, uh, those African roots. But when I stood on Ethiopian ground, it was the rhythms <laughs> in the earth that resonated with what was in my spiritual DNA. There was a connection. And I tell you today that in many ways, the way I hear people talk about Africa, and uh, some of us even, I say we, we, we ought to be careful. Because we as believers, I believe this with all my heart, that we, if you take the history of, of, um, uh, of Israel and Egypt, and Africans in the West during the last uh, 400 years, there are some parallels, you know. Uh, we, we, are the, we are the people of God in these last days. Uh, and why did God cho choose Israel? He chose Israel because they, they didn't have nothing. They, they weren't nothing. And he made them into something. But with Africa, it was different because they enslaved queens and kings and statesmen and academics and others and brought them to this nation. And it didn't take them long to figure out if we're going to build a White House, we can't do it. <laughs> but we know who can. And so, it's not just preaching the gospel uh, and having a good time on Sunday morning, but we need to reclaim and reaffirm our uh, gifts in terms of uh, economics and the sciences and all the all and the arts that are an integral part of our spirituality. Well, I am so deeply humbled by uh, when I think about who I am as, as a black man who knows Jesus in these last days. And the burden all of us have to live up to what God has called us to be. Bishop, They're not going to listen to what I just said, like you're listening to me. But when the Holy Spirit moves, that can't be ignored. So like we were said last night, if we don't have the power, then we are bankrupt in terms of what God has called us to do. That word of knowledge, it was a mixture of word of knowledge and prophetic utterance. Man, it was just so powerful. And I hope we walk away with some of that this weekend and remind ourselves that when we open our mouths to preach the gospel, that it's not just how we sound. And trying to stir up the masses. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. Starting in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the world, power, dunamis. I wish I had time to unpack that and what it meant. Um, when I started reading the book of Acts, and I am a Greek professor, New Testament Greek professor, and I can't get past certain passages because I just get stuck trying to unpack the depth of what the Holy Spirit is saying in the original there and how it impacts us today.
what it means to us today. But Bishop, can we just agree to collaborate? That we will collaborate with some folk, put something together where we can do this in a more formal, formal way. And I'm going to go even further. I'm going to say this. We need to write some of this stuff. We need to record it and we need to write it as a collaborative, scholarly writing, spirit-empowered. So we can put it in print and put it out there. Not just for white folk, but black folk need it just as bad. Because, you know, we have some ignorant black folk. <laughs> we have some ignorant Christians. Now, I'm a seminary guy. I'm a seminary president. But we have some educated, God help me here, with my vocabulary and my thoughts. We have some educated folk who don't understand who they are. Is ethnicity important as a Christian? Yes, it is. Because if you go to Acts chapter 13, and, and the Holy Spirit said, close on this one. And let me put up my notes. In Acts chapter 13, when... The gospel was uh, 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 being prepared to go out to the world, the first missionary journey. It didn't go forth out of Jerusalem. There was a place called Antioch in Syria <laughs> where they were first called Christians, I believe. Yeah. And Christian... And at that time, it was like being called the N-word. It was not a compliment. <laughs> it was probably nastier than calling somebody the N-word. They were called Christians first at Antioch. But out of that church, if you read the names of the, of the people who were in the church at Antioch, who were uh, working um, with, with, with Paul and the others preparing to take the gospel to the world in the first missionary journey. There were Europeans, Asians, and there were some Africans in there who were part of that group. And those folk changed the world, taking the gospel. That was not entrusted just to, to the Jew. But everybody got involved when the gospel was taken to the world to include Gentiles. But it was, there was that African connection that was in there that's always ignored. I cannot tell you how many church fathers. You know who the church fathers were, right? The church fathers were basically the disciples of the apostles. They were called the church fathers. And they were the ones who um, uh, uh, preached the gospel and taught and wrote. They did scholarly stuff, apologetics and all that kind of thing. But they, um, uh, 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 they, they were men who, uh, after the apostles were gone, they were the ones who were in the formation of the churches and uh, disciplines and doctrine in the early church. Many of those, many of the key church fathers were Africans. But when you look at uh, church history as uh, 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 European the theologians wrote it, everybody white. Now, I'm not saying that to be, uh, to say that, you know, I I'm just stating the truth. But the melanin was running deep. And 
see, here's the fact. We need everybody in this gospel thing. But we play a very special part because we're the people who have endured the suffering and the pain and the degradation and have come out out of all of that. And we're still going through it. But we are the model to the world of how faith uh, overcomes adversity. I've gone over my time, and the Holy Spirit is going to get me for this. But I will tell you this, as I go, go to my seat, we, we really have to do what I said earlier. Okay, we were going to do it, and, uh, and you all uh, are part of a historical event this weekend. Don't, don't underplay it. And all these folk, the bishop has uh, the, 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 the teaching on the Holy Spirit, the school of the Holy Spirit, is not in vain. Who else is doing that? Who on the planet is doing that? And here we are on East Grand Boulevard looking at the one that God said, you do it. You do it. You open the door. You do it. And, and, and she's not just on uh, social media doing this, but she's, see, he, he, here's the other thing. She's in school. Working toward that PhD. The PhD don't make you, but it won't hurt you. Because you've got to know something to teach something. And you've got to know what the era that has been taught. You have to understand that too before you can effectively teach the corrective. Okay, I think I'm just getting warmed up, but I'm going to my seat.